Shalom and greetings VFI supporters. This is one of my big supporters. All right. And anyone else watching this video. Now there's a lot of news to cover this week from all sorts of different angles going on and we can't cover it all in this one taping. However, stay tuned always on YouTube here for the Vision for Israel VFI news. Now, an Israel Air Force IAF aircraft struck terrorist Khalil Hussein Khalil al makta in the Sidon area of Lebanon. The military confirmed this on Wednesday. Now, al makta is the brother of Munir al makta a resident of Lebanon who operated for Hezbollah and the IRGC, that's the Iranian Revolutionary Guard Corps, attempting to carry out terror attacks, the IDF added. The two operated for the IRGC and were involved in guiding terror attacks, transferring of funds and weapons for West Bank, which is really called Judea and Samaria, and their infrastructure there. Well, the IDF names IRGC figures responsible for weapon smuggling terror attacks. The military specified that weapons that were uncovered in March 2024 were smuggled into the West Bank. Again, we call it Judea and Samaria. But this is the area governed by the Palestinian Authority, as if they were some moderate group. Well, they were destined for terror squads, which were enlisted and guided by the two brothers. The IDF also named Jawad Jafari, head of the Special Operations Unit in the IRGC's Intelligence Wing, Unit 4000, and Ashkar Bakari, commander of Unit 840, a Special Operations Unit in the Iranian Quds Force, as the guiding figures behind the smuggling of weapons to Israel and the planning of terror attacks. Meanwhile, back on the ranch, Pro-Hezbollah commentator Reda Saad stirred up a virtual storm in Lebanon following a sharp attack against his Christian compatriots when he claimed that the Christians' role in the country is over and American battleships are coming to the region to take them away. I just want to let you know we need to pray for the Lebanese Christian population in Lebanon. They are suffering because of Hezbollah's antics. In his controversial rant during an interview with Lebanon on News, Saad addressed his quote-unquote Christian brethren in Lebanon as he named them, warning them to pay attention carefully to his words. Quote, I fear that the Christians in Lebanon will face a similar destiny to that of the Afghans when they cling to the wheels of the American helicopters and are thrown from the sky, he said provocatively. He continued and said, I fear that you won't have an airport or a port to flee from, and perhaps the foreign warships are coming to take you to the last of you. Sa'ad lashed out against the Christian population in his country. Unfortunately, did you see where you ended up? You can't even appoint a president, he said, adding that the Christian Lebanon became synonymous with the American and Israeli ones and accusing them of collaborating with the French mandate and favoring French over Arabic. He goes on to rant and rave, so let everyone know that the role of Christians in Lebanon has ended, he declared. You have become a minority in this country and yet you still hold high positions. Nobody would accept this issue. The coming generations will not accept it. They will not accept that the president must be Christian. He must be a Sunni Muslim or Shiite. He goes on to say, we represent the majority in this country and we want our share in this sectarian regime. Saad stress referring to the sectarian method secured in Lebanon following the 1989 Taif Agreement, which ended the civil war and in which Christian Lebanese were allocated a majority of seats in parliament in addition to the office of president. Reactions to Saad's provocative words varied. On the supporter side, one commentator wrote, the man's words are clear and frank. Whoever chooses America has no one to blame but himself. While another one added, that's what they deserve, bravo. A third one from the South wrote, We are the people of the South. We are learned and intellectuals, and he is right. Well, you know what? I think they're barbarian intellectuals. Well, a fourth supporter attempted to differentiate good and bad Christians, adding, Well said, it's true, but Lebanon is for all people, not just for Shiites and Sunnis. I am a Shiite, and I refuse to live without the original honorable Christian, not the American and French tools. I see in them and the Marjayoun barracks a Zionist state. We all know it. The time has come for a state to hold accountable the racism that Shiite youth have been subjected to through injustice by the state. 
Well, the offensive interview predictively provoked the anger of the Christian population. One commenter pledged that the Christian community will remain proud, adding, quote, we will remain here like a thorn in your eye, and you, those who resemble you, do not represent Lebanon. Some users denounced Hezbollah's affiliation with Iran. Quote, welcome to the Islamic Republic of Lebanon, wrote one ironically. Another added, you have destroyed every regime in Yemen, Iraq, Syria, and Lebanon. You are specialists in smuggling to the whole world. You get all your technology from the Christian West. American ships are here to make sure that scoundrels like you are expelled from Lebanon. Several users replied cynically, can you let us remain here at least until the end of the month? I'm downloading something from the internet and it would be a shame that it goes to waste, said one ironic user, while another referred to Sa'ad's conscious state with a single word, Keptagon, an amphetamine known as the poor man's cocaine. Some commentators added that they had barely heard of Sa'ad's name before this interview and laughed at his ambition to present himself as a commentator. One user wrote, may God have mercy on such people. You don't know how they will emerge from underground and no one has heard of them in the first place and their existence is neither here nor there. Finally, one user replied with the pivotal and classic, he is an Israeli Zionist. That's it, always blame us. Well, Iran is in no position to fight a long-term war with Israel and even asked the United States to intervene to prevent a possible large-scale Israeli retaliation to any Iranian attack, according to Mohsen Sazaghari, founder of the Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps, in an exclusive interview with the Jerusalem Post. Well, that's new for the Post. Well, the IRGC was founded shortly after the 1979 revolution in Iran to protect the Islamic Republic's religious control over the country and to act as a counterbalance to the regular Iranian army, many of whose officers were still loyal to the Shah of Iran and therefore could not be trusted by the revolutionary regime. Now, since 1979, its authority and influence has spread throughout the world and it is considered one of the leading sponsors of Islamic terror globally. The group is now designated a terrorist organization by the United States. And speaking from the United States, where he is now based after leaving Iran more than 20 years ago, Sasagara also touched upon internal conflicts within the Islamic Republic and the problems facing Supreme Leader Ayatollah Ali Khamenei. This is what he goes on to say. What Israel did, I mean the alleged assassination of Hamas chief Ismail Haniya in the heart of Tehran, in one of the most protected places, was a humiliation for the intelligence organizations of Iran. Sazagari stated, this has created a problem for Khamenei among his main power base, the intelligence services. Khamenei's first reaction was that, we retaliate and don't stop. But when he referred to his military commanders and the experts in the IRGC and they should present the options of what to do, they told him that Iran is not in a position to fight Israel. That's right. They don't have any strategic balance. They can send missiles towards Israel, especially hypersonic missiles that can reach Israel in six to eight minutes. But when Israel retaliates, then we can't defend the country, especially air defense, Khamenei's commanders told him. They told them that, quote, Iran is not in a position to fight Israel. They emphasized that even if we launch an attack, we should immediately consider a ceasefire with international mediators. What chickens? Well, anyhow, that's the facts. In a wide-ranging interview with The Post, the former revolutionary-turned-politician discussed his role in the revolution, his relationship with its leader Ayatollah Khamenei, the founder of the IRGC, and how his political views evolved against the state religion axis that rules in the Islamic Republic, which led to being barred from the 2001 Iranian presidential elections. Sasagara was managing director of the National Radio of Iran between 1979 and 1981, before serving in a multitude of political roles in the 80s. He served as political deputy in the prime minister's office, deputy minister of heavy industries, chairman of the Industrial Development and Renovation Organization of Iran, and vice minister of planning and budget. Speaking about the U.S. role in the growing conflict between Israel and Iran, Sasagara stated that, as far as I know, Iran behind the scenes negotiated with the U.S. and the Biden administration and asked them to talk to Israel. Is Biden still president there? 
stating that Iran would attack somewhere in Israel and promised nobody will be killed, but Israel should not retaliate. Iran asked the United States to put pressure on Israel not to retaliate enough to escalate. But this time, the United States did not agree and told them that we can't prevent Israel. For Sazagara, Khamenei faces multiple challenges in considering any military action against Israel. First, a limited attack risks provoking a significant Israeli retaliation, which could lead to the defeat of Iran's armed forces. Okay. Such a defeat could threaten Khamenei's power, as historically humiliated armed forces can often bite the hand that feeds them. Secondly, Iran's economy is fragile struggling with issues like energy production, inflation, unemployment, and daily strikes. This economic instability further complicates the prospects of engaging in war. I got a question, though. I thought that the Biden administration was sending billions of dollars over there. How could they be suffering? Well, I hope that's going to come to an end soon. Lastly, Khamenei lacks the support of the Iranian people for a war with Israel. Intelligence gathered indicates that the majority of Iranians oppose any conflict with Israel, leaving Khamenei potentially isolated if he chooses to pursue military action, although knowing the forcefulness with which the regime cracks down on dissent, that thought may be far from the Ayatollah's mind. Three senior Iranian officials told Reuters last week that only a ceasefire deal in Gaza could prevent Iran from directly retaliating against Israel for Khania's assassination. Now, I wonder, guys out there and ladies, what would happen if there is no ceasefire? Well, anyhow, diplomatic envoys have been working tirelessly behind the scenes to de-escalate the situation. This is a face-saving measure to allow the regime to fall back and present the people with some form of a pirate victory, according to Sasagara. I'm sure that in Iran, the propaganda will say that Israel was actually afraid of us and accepted the ceasefire, should a deal be agreed, he told the Jerusalem Post. They have to do something to say to their followers that this was a show of power, that Israel accepted a ceasefire. And if these Israel-Hamas negotiations go nowhere and there is no ceasefire, I don't know what Khamenei will do, but I guess that he would consider using Iran's proxy groups to retaliate against Israel. By the way, that's exactly what's going on right now. Iran is pushing Hezbollah to attack Israel. Not Iran, but Hezbollah. All right, meanwhile, going on, Kuwait experienced widespread power outages on Sunday as authorities attempted to manage the nation's electrical grid amid extreme heat and increased energy demand. The Electricity, Water, and Renewable Energy Ministry said the blackouts affected several areas, including residential neighborhoods, agricultural regions, and industrial zones. The outages were attributed to a technical malfunction in the fuel supply system combined with surging energy use as temperatures, listen people, approached 50 degrees Celsius. That's 122 degrees Fahrenheit. I feel hot already. More air, more air. The disruptions impacted six key industrial zones, three agricultural areas, and parts of 31 residential neighborhoods. Wow, that is hot. In response to the heat wave and power demands, the ministry has urged residents to cut back on electricity use, particularly during peak consumption times between 11 a.m. and 5 p.m. The ministry also warned that additional power cuts may be imposed in areas with the highest demand to help stabilize the grid. 122 degrees. Did you hear that? Well, hundreds of ultra-Orthodox now back in our sphere from the extreme factions demonstrated on Wednesday. We have demonstrations all the time. Well, near the area of the IDF recruitment office in Jerusalem, where I was recruited a long time ago. Well, this was reported by Israeli media. The police said dozens of protesters blocked nearby streets with fences, clashed with Israel police and border police officers, insulted them, and attempted to break through fences police had erected outside the recruitment office because that recruitment office is right within the ultra-Orthodox neighborhoods. Well, the police added it was operating to remove the protesters from the area who had blocked nearby streets. In parallel, protesters blocked the light rail on Jaffa Street. According to a Jerusalem Post eyewitness at the Haturim light rail station, a bystander shoved one of the demonstrators out of the way while a police officer also helped to clear the track. 
Later, similar scenes were observed by a post witnessed at the Haturim light rail station. Mounted officers arrived to try and disperse the crowds. Shortly after they left, a brief scuffle broke out in front of the light rail. Five ultra-Orthodox demonstrators have been arrested on charges of disorderly conduct and assaulting police officers in Jerusalem. That's not nice, according to a police report on Wednesday. Meanwhile, on another angle of life, the unemployment rate in Israel in July fell to 2.8%. That's incredible. The Central Bureau of Statistics reports down from 3.1% in June. Now, this is a particularly low rate that has not been seen for many years. Why? Unemployment last November after seasonal adjustment and the mass mobilization of Army reservists at the start of the war was initially set at 2.8%, but subsequent revised figures raised it to 3%. The latest low figures also stem from many Israelis still performing Army Reserve duty who are not available for civilian employment. This creates employment demand and huge shortages in the workforce, which has also been reflected over the past year in a rise in real wages despite the economic slowdown. Now, the percentage of Israelis aged 15 and older participating in the labor force remains almost unchanged at 63%, up from 62.9% last month. And the employment rate also rose slightly to 61.2% from 61%. The rate of those registered as employees but absent from work due to reserve duty is still 9.4%, but significantly lower compared with the previous month of 15.6%. Not that any of you care out there, but in case you're really interested, I'm telling you all this. For men, the number is even more extreme. 22.1% of the employees are absent due to reserve duty, down from 28.5% the previous month. Hey, anybody out there, you want to come and join the IDF? Write me, because I'm telling you, we need more soldiers and we need to build this country back up. Well, anyhow, the broad unemployment rate, which also includes those have given up looking for work and were employed people who were absent from work because they were put on unpaid leave, also fell from 4.8% in June to 4.4% in July. These are particularly low rates which support the rise in wages. The figures also include the return of some of the reservists to work, but this is still an artificially low rate because almost 1 in 10 employees remain in the Army Reserves. It's a lot of people serving in the Army Reserves. So I'm asking you on behalf of Vision for Israel, please pray for our Army Reservists, pray for our soldiers, pray for the police, pray for all those in the intelligence services, Pray that we'll finally be able to find this guy, Sinwar, who in the latest news reports is running out of equipment and weaponry and ammunition and hopefully food and hopefully he won't be no more Sinwar around. We need to pray for the release of the hostages, both the live ones and the dead ones, because Israel believes in bringing everybody back home to their families. And so with that, I want to encourage you by letting you know that this week we just installed another 10 safety shelters to protect the Jewish, Arab, Druze populations of Israel along the northern and southern borders of Israel because Hezbollah continues with having shot over 7,000 rockets now since October 8th of 2023. So pray for the peace of Jerusalem, pray for Israel, and pray for the good news. God bless you and shalom. I'm Barry Siegel.